Welcome to another Machinations webinar. Uh, we are the game balancing platform for game systems and economies. And we're very excited today because we're going to be talking with the Heroes of Mavia team about Web3 and what they're doing in that space. Ivan and his team have been using Machinations to verify their economy um, and sharing their learnings with their community. So we're gonna go over why that's important and how the transparency uh, has helped them in the process. We're also going to be talking about how Machinations can serve uh, a pivotal role in you know, the Web3 gaming space by verifying economies. You know, there's a lot of concerns happening in the space. You know, people are citing a lot of issues regarding economies, scams, all these things. How can how machinations can be there to audit these game economies and, and ensure sustainability? You know, that's something that um, uh, we're, we're interested to explore in the space. And uh, we're going to be talking about how uh, heroes of Mavia, you know, have benefited from that. So I'm Mohammed. I'm a game designer at Machinations. And uh, Matthew, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, Matthew. So I'm one of our, our game designers and evangelists. You've probably all seen me before in some of these uh, sessions. Uh, today, I'm going to be doing a quick intro and then handing over to the, the brilliant team that we've got with us today. Perfect. Cesar, though he's not with us in the webinar, has worked on today's model. So shout outs to him. And Ivan, can you give us an intro, please? Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm executive executive uh, producer um, at Scrice, and I'm uh, mostly responsible for all the aspect of the game related to the graphics, especially like the uh, the trailers, the game, and the uh, marketing as well as the game design. Uh, when it comes to the Ruby simulation, for instance, uh, I was driving this effort, and um, yeah, this is it for now. Excellent. Tristan, can you give us an intro? Yeah, sure. So I'm a managing director here at Strike Studios, and my job consists of balancing a lot of the, the crypto sides of things on the Web3 end, uh, product design, so UI design of the web platform, and a lot of the game mechanics. So I, I get into the game mechanics as well. I work alongside Avon with art. But, uh, but what I really enjoy doing is product design and user experience. So when you see the staking flows, when you see the new concepts we come out with for community engagement, a lot of that is led by me. So one last thing is Q&As are at the end, but keep your questions going. I uh, curate them. Uh, so ask them as we go along and I'll take care of that at the end. Uh, also, we notice a lot of people watch our videos on YouTube. So, you know, if you're checking out the recording, which is going to go live uh, a couple of weeks from now, uh, you should subscribe to the YouTube channel. We have a lot of game design content on there. Uh, previous webinars and all future content will go there as well. We also have our Machinations Discord. There's a huge community there. We're talking about game design all the time. So join us there. The links will be in the chat and introduce yourself there. On that note, I think uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, we can kick off. Matthew, uh, I know you'll share your screen, so uh, take it away. Perfect. Um, I actually had the pleasure of watching the, the Heroes of Mavia uh, AMA yesterday and seeing some of the absolutely incredible fan art that's been created and obviously game assets that you were teasing us with, uh, which were just incredible. But today we're going to take a very different look at the game and we're going to be talking about some fairly abstract um, views of the game. There's no pretty graphics in this. We're just going to be looking at the machinations models and how we can start to plan out the economy. So I thought I'd just give a quick introduction to this. Uh, and then I'll, I'll hand it over to the Mavia team to go into more detail. So here's a really simplified core game loop um, that we look at in Machinations. We're using these objects to build them together so that we can simulate the, the game economy. And one of the big challenges that we face in this is that um, as players progress through the game, they play the game, they're going to earn rubies, they're going to use these rubies to upgrade the base and upgrade different items in the, in the journey. Then we've got this additional path now with this interaction between the players where they can obviously sell these rewards through the uh, marketplaces. So it's not just one of you that are going to be playing this game. There's going to be a huge number. And this is all going on simultaneously. And 
by the looks of the game and the community that's already growing around it, it's going to be very popular. So there's going to be a huge number of uh, players coming into the experience at different times and having different stages of progression. These are obviously going to be linked together through different marketplaces and uh, token exchanges. Players are going to be able to um, purchase different tokens, different items that uh, have already been teased. And ultimately, all of this will be linked to the cryptocurrency value. So with machinations, it allows us to view and I'd be able to understand what we're going to be going through and what the impact of one player's progression and one player's experience, how that can impact everybody else. Today, the area that we're going to be focusing on uh, is really kind of fleshing out this, this first section and looking at what the progression system is going to be like. And just to kind of tease you how we're going to be understanding and testing out the game economy through machinations to make sure it's a really stable, solid game economy. Here's the overall model, that very, very simple uh, kind of core game loop. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more that actually goes on in reality once we kind of get into this um, and a huge complexity of, of the economy. So uh, I'm going to go pretty briefly over it because I think at this point uh, we have already uh, explained it a couple of times in various uh, uh, AMA, but uh, I'm, I cannot guarantee that everyone in this conversation have seen it. So I just want to go pretty quickly over it. Uh, so as Matthew have shown, uh, we are basically using machination because it's an amazing way to represent data flowing. It's much better than using a Google spreadsheet or uh, this type of stuff. And for me, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a playground because I really love nodes pretty much. And uh, I love the procedural logic. And this is, uh, this is making a lot of sense for uh, making predictions um, based on probabilities. So uh, as we can see, the, the idea is that uh, every day, every uh, couple of times a day, there is battles that are done and there is chances to lose the game, win the game uh, for one star, two star and three star. And depending on that, we have different mechanisms that are triggered. Sometimes uh, we have we mint new ruby. So it's pretty much like printing a bill, you know, and on the other side, sometimes we burn a ruby. So that's like burning uh, a bill. And there is also another type of mechanism, which consists of stealing Ruby to other players. Of course, you cannot steal everything from other players because what happens is that first, the uh, Ruby that you win during a, a battle, they arrive on the map on, in your war chest. So the war chest, we have some uh, illustration of that. I can show it later. But the idea is that during the time it's into the war chest, basically the ruby that are inside are exposed on the map. The same way as you know in Clash of Clans, you've got your uh, gold exposed, your uh, oil exposed. That's the same idea. And during that time, basically it represents a challenge, a challenge for you because you need to basically protect that. And uh, every three days, uh, basically you can cash out the totality of your war chest to your bank. In, when it's in your bank, it's into a sort of bunker below the map. Nobody can access it ever that's really uh, yours when it's because when it is in the bank and uh and the idea is that different um there is multiple ways in the system to uh incitate people to spend their ruby the first being the obvious headquarter um, which is uh, mostly something that needs to be done through the bank because the war chest probably never will contain enough to spend on a war chest and there is a lot of variety of spendings for instance there is the consumables uh, training an army, um, upgrading a building, all of these aspects. But there is also the, the, the because, because uh, the heroes and the lands and the uh, statues are NFTs, they, um, they can be upgraded. They, you can have skins on them. And so it represents as well a sort of investment because it's the same as like if you are playing Counter Strike or World of Warcraft, when you have a skin that others don't have, the day you resell your account, it, it's worth more than others. So there is this idea that uh, when you have, uh, instead of uh, just being capped to the maximum of the war chest, you could just wait a couple of days later, you know, until you cash out. But if you want to really badly play now, you just spend five ruby into a skin or something, you know, and then you make a couple more win and then you get your five ruby back. So that's, I think, the way that people are gonna uh, spend the overflow of uh, ruby uh, into uh, a lot of uh, variety. And that's, uh, that's the reason why when we build the game, we are creating a, like a huge library of skins. Uh, we are going, to, we're going very deep into that aspect. 
And the particularity with uh, other games is usually when you make skins in the shop, basically this money goes to the company. In our case, the money goes to the player because all the spendings that you do in the game could be headquarters, uh, skin or whatever is, uh, is Ruby that is burned which means that uh, who own the ruby, the, the ruby uh, are owned by the players. So it makes the value of the ruby go higher every time someone basically uh, just upgrade the quarter, et cetera. And so the challenge with this uh, representation, I'm skipping also a lot of mechanisms like where your matches over there, uh, Boeing ruby, where you know you mean some, when you cash out, you uh, burn some, uh, the, the daily challenges, which I'm not so sure where I've put this. But that's a bit the idea. Um, yeah, so I think uh, we can continue from there. And um, this uh, overall simulation allows to uh, predict uh, curves, basically. Essentially, that's the, that's the idea. So we can predict on many days, like uh, almost a year, uh, where it's going to go. And, uh, and so we can change the variables. Uh, change the um, features, you know, their value and everything, and see the impact that it happened. And uh, we can play with machination. That's the that's really the, the nice thing about it is you can not only make your uh, curves, you know, your simulation, but you can calculate it a thousand times and then uh, average the results, and it gives you a better idea now uh, if that's true or not. Because you can, it's like throwing the dice, you know, on the table and expecting for a uh, always the same uh, average, but it's, you have to throw the dice uh, a million times to get like an ID, right? So, um, okay, that I think is uh, the presentation. We can uh, continue from there, Mathieu. Um, right, so the first thing I want to kick off with um, is something very interesting, which is the fact that in this model, every step, so when we press play, everything happens in the form of steps. So the first thing uh, we want to acknowledge is that in this model, every 10 steps is one in-game day. So what, what's basically happening here is that when we go to the, to the war chests and the, and the bank, we'll see something very interesting here, which is that you can, the, the interval at which uh the the cashing out happens and the war chest uh saving happens is every 30 uh steps which is the equivalent of three days which is what ivan said and that's that's the first important uh distinction i wanted to make so what we have here is the players will play they'll get their their rubies and in this version of the model which Cesar worked on, we have something here, which is the purchase power, right? And this basically comes from the war chest, comes from the bank, and uh, also comes from players buying Ruby. And we'll get into the, the multiple uh, player personas very soon. And essentially this purchase power is the skeleton or the backbone of this model, because from there, you know, just like Ivan mentioned, players can upgrade their HQ and they can also uh, spend on, on items. Uh, and there's uh, different scenarios here. So purchases where the war chest is, is full without a bank, purchased where the, purchases where the war chest is not full and purchases uh, where uh, it's done through war chest and bank. And of course, these have uh, different uh, costs. So coming out of these scenarios, one of the first things that we want to uh, uh, acknowledge is that each game has player personas, right? So we've mapped out five personas for this model. There's the people who will cash out straight away, right? They're play to earn players. Their fundamental goal is to make money. So these kind of players aren't looking to be competitive. They're looking to make as much money as possible. So that's the first type of player. The second type of player is a competitive player. That's someone who wants to compete at the highest ranks. Uh, they love the game. They love the aspect of competition. Um, and they're going to have uh, different uh, purchase strategies. 
the collectors are the kind of people who uh, like many aspects of the game and aren't necessarily following the meta, like the competitive player who is always up to date with the meta, changing their strategies uh, according to the meta, their heroes according to the meta. The collector is trying to collect as much as possible and have a nice variety of heroes, a nice variety of land decorations and statues. Um, and the uh, casual player is the kind of player who, you know, every day they join the game, they have something that they want to do. You know, some days it's competitive battling, other days it's uh, cashing out, you know, some days it's, uh, it's you know, collecting and, and, and buying different things. So the casual player doesn't really have a, a set strategy when it comes to how they're playing the game or an end goal in mind. And, and the final persona is what we call build enjoyers. And, you know, I'm that kind of player. Uh, in card games, for example, uh, I like specific builds that appeal to me. And, you know, if they're in the meta, great. If they're not in the meta, you know, that that's fine too. I just really enjoy playing with a specific class or playing with a specific deck in a card game um, or playing with specific heroes. And uh, I'm always going to play them. And so I'm always going to max out um, as much as I can from what I enjoy. The other thing is that, you know, these kind of players, they're semi-competitive so you'll see them you know adhere to the meta to some degree while sticking also to their core build so you know if their build is out of the meta they're just going to switch a couple of things around while maintaining you know the same strategy and, and style of play so these are sort of the five personas we've mapped out and one of the things that we've done is you'll see in the formulas here we've changed uh these registers to be based on the uh, personas. So A is the persona, right? The state connection comes from the persona pool. And this register, you know, it says, you know, if A equal one, right? So if we're, we're using persona one, if the pool, the number of resources in the pool is one, then multiply the register by, you know, this amount. If it's two, uh, multiply it by this amount. And so this is how we change the values based on the persona. And you'll see this throughout. So I want to go back to uh, purchasing rubies. So this is the uh, state connection that comes from the persona, right? State connection A comes from the player persona. It goes all the way here to the register that manages the purchase of rubies. And you'll see like the different personas. So, you know, the play to earn player they want to earn money. They don't want to spend uh, on rubies. So, you know, you're not going to multiply it with a high number. Whereas if you look at you know, the second persona, you know, the competitive player, they want to buy rubies so that, you know, they can max out their heroes or max out, you know, uh, their HQ because the HQ unlocks uh, more heroes. And some of those heroes might be part of the meta. So, you know, they're, they're going to spend a lot on purchasing rubies. So, you know, by using that persona uh, pool, we're able to change these values and run simulations accordingly. So one final thing I wanted to point out is we have those same uh, registers here as well when it comes to the purchases. And you'll see, you know, when it comes to something like the land decoration, uh, when we run the simulations, you'll see that, you know, the competitive player is focused on you know, their heroes and their builds and their HQ and, you know, dealing as much damage as possible, they're not really focused on, on land decoration, right? They want to make sure that all their, their resources, you know, aligns with their strategic goal when it comes to playing the game, which is, you know, being number one, competing and, and winning. So that's sort of like how we've, uh, you know, updated the model to include five player personas, of course, there are many more. We just used five as like a, a, a good start. And how we've added the, um, the purchase power uh, pool here, which is the backbone of this model, which controls, uh, you know, where all the rubies come from and how players spend it. Looks amazing, love the uh, updates. Um... I am. Uh, it's. It. I think it's. Uh, it's funny. It's not that how I imagined it, uh, but I think it works the same. Uh, I thought that we will generate results and re-import them and recombine them after. 
but uh, it's a possibility as well like this. I'm yeah. just going to um, step in and just uh, kind of a, a slight caveat, which is to just let everybody know, obviously, this is all work in progress. Uh, if you see any numbers on the screen, you know, everything will probably change a lot of times between now and um, when the game's released. Um, but actually, Aiden, so that actually kind of becomes a question for you. Like, how do you foresee kind of the, the iteration process and in, in the development process of as you, as you go through and balance this uh, system? Interesting question. So the, the, the process right now, I have spent uh, maybe, I, when did I start this? Maybe in December, something like that. And I'm, uh, I'm uh, doing my best to, to spend some time on it, but because my responsibilities are so uh, scattered, it's difficult to dedicate like a full month on it. But my the deadline I saw for this is basically the alpha, the beta, the release. You know, it, this is, it doesn't have to be finished by the end of the week because it doesn't matter at all, especially if it's finished by, by now. Uh, we will continue adding features, you know, along the way, based on community feedback, on uh, or just like what we think is good. And plus, we have actually features that we never announced yet. So the problematic I have is that I cannot complete the, the model until uh, further in the time, because until we revealed all the components, you know, uh, plus that we also locked the value. Uh, so that's the reason why, indeed, when we look at this uh, this uh, simulation right now, it's just a work in progress. That's the reason why it's called Ruby Simulation 0.2. And as I told you before, you know, I don't imagine it going uh, uh, less than like version 2.0, 3.0. You know, it, it's just something that basically has to be adjusted along the way. So it's going to have iterations every couple of months for like years. It's what it's the way I imagine this. It cannot just like stop at some point and say, oh, we're done, you know. Uh, it has to always evolve and we have to compare it with the live data, you know, one way or another, live or uh, almost live. But this is uh, the idea. Um, so no, 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 honestly, I think it's a tool that definitely has to accompany us during, during the, the, the way because um, one thing that is it, what I told you before, uh, it's like a representation of uh, big data. You know, I give you a database with so much data. What do you do with that? You start to make P charts. You start to make uh, data flowing between one thing. And now you start to see some through. You start to see relationship between stuff. So that's exactly what uh, machination is but for us, for the Ruby flow. So, um, yeah, this is like a long term process. It's not something we can say, oh, it's going to be finished in two weeks. Plus, there is no point to finish in two, in two weeks. So it's going to be evolving all during the, the way. And that is, the way I see it is at least like four or five big moments of work into it, you know, uh, before it's released. So now I did maybe two times uh, and it created this. And you know, I did it on Firefox. So if you use it, use Chrome, guys. It's a good advice. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, your, your mic was muted, Matthew. Um, and uh, but this is uh, this is yeah, this is the, the the situation with this. It's a great tool. It helps to visualize data, especially data flowing. It helps to visualize probabilities. And since what we are building is very important to have something solid and stable, and there is so many components, these components that are not yet into the simulation, also I will look in one way or another to make them talk to the simulation. Because maybe uh, then uh, Tristan can explain further after that. But you know, there is not only the game to balance, because if I was making the game design uh, the most perfectly balanced, you know, it, it takes all the personas and there is everything that's perfect so there is a balance of uh, you know one for one you every, every time the game burn uh, creates one ruby it burn one somewhere else right so, and there is a liquidity that come inside and, and then the game produce uh, basically no over burning or no over minting uh, that would be great but the problem is that it's not enough because the game itself is the game but next to that you've got the markets you've got all of that that are related so uh, this is where uh, we have things in plan, but haven't revealed everything yet also. Uh, one of the angle, plus all the mechanisms of gaming, but this one is with the markets. And this is something that to get the whole picture, you need that as well, I think so. Because it's a whole ecosystem, it's not just a game. And because uh, if it was just a game, honestly, I, I'm not even sure that this thing could work. Otherwise, it will mean that you need to have constantly people, you know, who spend skins and people who this is have to be a one to one. But the beauty of this system, I think what's show, showing and it's interesting. If I get back to uh, my uh, 
my, my presentation, or I, I can think I have to, to just screen share. But the idea here is that it doesn't have to be balanced the way, uh, like, do you see my screen now? Yeah. Yeah, cool. So you see here, for instance, you see, um, I give you an example where you see here, every time that uh, we do a battle, basically the idea is that when you do a three star, you steal something like three ruby to the other person, one is burned, right? But so two is uh, just exchange between wallets. There is no, uh, there is no nothing that change, and one is burnt. But here, in some occasion, you can win two. So you may think, okay, if just this thing was out of context, you may think that's not sustainable, right? Because this is uh, you don't burn enough that you mint. You see, and so. But the, 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 the idea is that there is many other systems, and so these systems sometimes burn more than they mint. So some of them means more than they burn, some burn more than they mean, and overall as an ecosystem, then it's how it can be sustainable. So this is a multitude of uh, mechanisms, not just one. And they have to be related to each other. So we have a question from the audience that I think is relevant to ask now, which is, uh, you know, when it comes to building and iterating on the model, um, what surprises you know, do you find and how do you adjust your model to address those surprises? Um, oh, wow. This is a, this is a, a night long conversation with Tristan and me. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> I have no explanation. It's like, oh, we have a problem. Here is, here is this, because if we see this under this angle, we have a problem. So we are looking to solve it. And what, and the way we solve it is always, uh, I like it because uh, Tristan and me has different um, perspective uh, on a problem. And I think the solution is really when, the best solution is when we have both, you know, at, uh, attacking the, the problem on different angles. So I will look like, hey, how can the story tell this? How can, uh, you can feel good about it? How, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the vision towards the game design and the marketing, but as an image, you know, and uh, that's, that's uh, very important because it's like the storyline. Just an example, the fact that the ruby in the game is uh, on an island and that uh, people come here as a colonist to extract it and take the energy, then you understand why a hero can smash the ruby and get absorbed the energy of the ruby. That's the symbol of someone who upgrade the hero. All of these things, I believe, are great to justify the universe in which the player are, because then they identify themselves or, you know, they identify the universe as like something logical, you know. So uh, when a bad guy attack you, you know why, you know who he is, you know, and it makes sense. Same as like this war chest, you know. So this is ways that we have to approach where um, it's, uh, it's supporting the system. People like the ID, community accept it because uh, I, uh, I know I have also been working on other uh, community with uh, games, etc. And I know that, you know, uh, money community is two things that usually doesn't really work well. You know, uh, it only works well when you have like, uh, you know, games where people, if, if, if they know that they can purchase a skin, but it's going to change the direction of a game, they will do it no problem. But if like it's just like a, a luxury thing, you know, uh, they tend always to like uh, don't like the studios who make them. But in that case, there is so much things that are different than usual game. Just the idea like we make skins, we don't make them for us. We make them for the community and we have planned 42 ski, uh, teams, you know, for each unit, each stuff. That's a lot of work and all of that effort goes into the community hands. So you see, this is a, we are trying to make this work because we do it with the community because uh, without the community, there is just no game, you know? And, uh, and so, yeah, both taking the feedback, but also going with this angle, you know, because that's how I think we will be successful uh, with a community that's happy and things that make sense that are integrated into universe, then we can expand to a larger franchise. That's our idea, you know? So we are here to stay, that's our logic, you know? So we are doing things with the will definitely to, to stay in the in the crypto landscape because uh, yeah, that's why we build things uh, with sustainability in mind. You know, as you know, I did not wait <laughs> uh, to know you, uh, Matthew, to uh, to start with Machination. I was looking into uh, how I can solve uh, you know any uh, kind of doubts. You know, and um, and uh, and then we will continue with this energy all the time long. So that's the approach that which we solve problems is that. We see them under different angles, business, uh, crypto, 
you know, economy aspect, game design, uh, feeling of, you know, when you play, you know, the fun feeling, the, uh, uh, all of these aspects that you have to think when you make a game, uh, plus the business aspect. And the solution, the good answer, often comes from like a mix between ideas from Tristan and me, because we have like, the, uh, then it becomes a solid thing. Because uh, I feel like sometimes it will be just too business or it will be too artistic, you know, and the right answer is something that works in both, you know, because things we make should not be only pretty, you know, <laughs> they have to actually make sense and it has to be a business. So people actually can uh, cash out and it doesn't uh, crash after two months, you know, <laughs> that's definitely uh, the point. So this is, uh, this is why we, we take this very seriously and, and uh, turn around the question under many different uh, angles. So th that's a very important point, and there's a question to follow up on it that I'll ask. But first, there's a point that was uh, made, which is, you know, regarding the distribution of personas. We had a couple of questions regarding that. So um, one of the things I wanted to, to sort of stress is that in this model, that's a, that's a single player model, uh, right? So when we uh, run the, the simulation, we put the uh, player persona in the pool. Right, so uh, depending on the persona we want to simulate, uh, we change the pool to the resources that would, you know, equate that persona, and we run the simulation, and, and that's how we get, you know, a, a single player's average over, you know, x amount of days or x amount of playthroughs. We take that data, and then we sort of insert it into a much bigger model, which is the economy model, um, and that's how we were able to uh you know project you know the the larger games uh player uh you know how they as a, as a as a persona as a whole in the game rather than just a single player so we take that data and, and we add it into another model that sort of extrapolates that data and we're able to then you know calculate the overall economy accordingly um so that's just a single player model it doesn't account for uh, every player of that persona rather one player of that persona and we extrapolate that data um in the larger model uh, so i just wanted to stress on that um and you know uh even i have a question that a lot of people uh, want answered which is when you're sort of doing the modeling when it comes to you know having all these variables scattered across uh you know the machinations uh user interface are you able to sort of keep track of you know where everything is and and you know how the resources are flowing and where the variables are um uh, honestly, uh, it's um, it's uh, it's a little difficult, uh, but I've, I make it easier with colors and um, uh, I think uh, over time um, the some some of this can be automated, you know, to make a quality of life, you know, when you you, you work on it. Um, well, the way I try to organize it uh, is that I try to group into areas, you know, and the, the thing it was uh, so so I agree. There is a, a um, a problem by going like very large is that then you have to connect very far you know in your nodes and sometimes you end up being like okay what where does it come from already and you have to go back and check so this is a bit the back and forth so the way i'm doing is actually i'm getting i'm doing a, a register to a register that does nothing just get me this register so it's kind of like nulls in udini where it is it's useless, but it's just to <laughs> give me like the, the path I want, you know, so I can transfer the data and then I can make, you know, a bridge from there, a bridge from there. So it's the way I organize a bit to, to, to get this variable somewhere else in the graph and the, the somewhere else is very far. Um, and uh, yeah, otherwise it's a very logical process. So you, and also sometimes probably what I'm going to do is also erase everything and restart from scratch, you know, at some point, you know, rewrite it down, you know, very cleanly, because, uh, you know, there is always the idea that when you build something, at least the way I build something procedural in 3D, and I, I feel there is some similarities here, is that I first build it to make it work, and then I go back to it and tweak it to make it beautiful. So first, that's that's my process. First, I make it work, then I get it, make it uh, makes more sense and precisely, you know. Uh, and then also I make sure that I have colors and uh, very uh, bright colors on the lines, you know, so I can really, uh, they don't become everywhere, you know. So colors, organization, logic, and uh, following register and this thing.
Perfect. A quick question, because um, actually you've been super transparent out to your community about the kind of the process that you're going through and you know what you're what how you're thinking and applying uh, kind of game industry best practices to make sure you've got a, a super sustainable economy. Um, there was a question in the in the kind of in the Q and A just asking how much how much of the information you're going to share, how much are you going to kind of hold back slightly if at all. Like where do you where do you think that balance point is? And for other developers, like what's your view on how much you should share with your community of, of how your economy is designed? Uh, honestly, I am one hundred percent in favor of uh, games who open one hundred percent their project management or stuff like this. Uh, it has happened many times in, uh, before me. Uh, there was, uh, for instance, I remember Subnautica. The, you you can see their Trello. You see everything there. Uh, the game I was working before, I even had my uh, project management, project management be the same as the wiki and also connected to the Discord and the game. So whenever a developer, he click a checkbox or a new task is added, boom, it goes on Discord. And everybody knows instantly. There is no lag of communication where people are like, well, they don't care about my problem. And, uh, and, and, and then at, actually at the same time, it's not true. Sometimes you have like a two or three people working on a bug and, and you have 10 people complaining, it doesn't move forward. So I think you have to really uh, show a lot because uh, also uh, many people don't really understand completely what is you know, creating a game. And the more you take them with you, the more they understand the struggles, the more they understand what's difficult, what's easy, where, where we are good, where we're not, you know, or see or that. So, um, so I, I just believe that it solves so many problems of communication. If you can do it, just uh, be open on everything uh, that you can, you know. Uh, because you still have to keep some secrets because, you know, the secrets, for instance, especially, you know, marketing wise, you know, you don't want to first day explain everything you have. You want to keep some good stuff, you know, for 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 giving some good news. So we have stuff like this. Uh, there is at least already three or four on top of my head that are every every time we're going to talk about it, people are going to be excited. So we don't give all the excitement in one go. But at the same time, we are producing very fast. We have like a lot of artists and uh, we I like to give get the opinions of the community even for the skins we make uh, uh, because it just makes sense. We're, we're building the, the, the game for our community and uh, I want them to be part of that. So the way to do it is to actually be transparent and let them see the information so they don't have, even have to ask. And then the community between themselves are gonna become moderators and reply to each other because they just have the information. The people who are lazy, they don't know, they ask, and some people that are not lazy, they're invested, they, they reply. And so as a wall, it becomes more powerful than if we were like keeping every secret behind the door, not saying anything. Um, I, look, this is the reason why also we are here with Machination, you know, because we were so open, we could have done like many others, probably just work with Machination and say to nobody that we use Machination. But uh, I don't care because I think by uh, taking people part of the process, they saw that we, we, we are not shy on that, you know, and I think it's very sensible that, uh, you know, people uh, trust, you know, our, uh, even if we were just making a simple game, we will need to convince people to trust us if we make a Kickstarter or something, you know, and here this is the same uh, as a Kickstarter or something. So you, you want to be uh, showing evolutions constantly, be very open as much as you can while keeping some secrets again, because that's good cards to play at the right time. And um, this is it. Got it. Uh, great, great view. Nice. So, yeah, we're getting a couple of questions on Persona, so I'll just answer that really quickly. Uh, questions around, you know, how do you determine the Personas to begin with? Uh, how do you determine, you know, how each per Persona will purchase? So. Uh, first of all, I want to stress, like Matthew said, none of the numbers in this model are, uh, are you know, based on anything. Uh, this is just, you know, uh, uh, an imaginary uh, numbers. But, but when it comes to sort of decisions and how you should go by them, uh, well, essentially, you know, you start with sort of like a some sort of like market analysis, right? You see uh, what kind of personas are in other games or games of the same genre. Um, and you also understand, you know, again, based on data, you know, what are their, their purchase habits, what are their uh, play habits, um, and you sort of like 
put that and anything that's missing, you make a close assumption. And then from there, you know, once you, you know, have your game live, you change that based on real player data and you monitor the economy and you monitor the, your, your game systems and your gameplay loops. And, you know, if there's something you feel is not right, then, you know, you, you know, you tweak that, you run the simulations, you see, you know, if it's improved or not. And then from there, you, you update your live game, it goes live, you get the player data, rinse and repeat. So it's just a sustainable way of doing game design. Um, but yeah, another question, Ivan, which uh, is, is very interesting and, uh, you know, it's important given, you know, everything that's uh, being discussed in the Web3 space, uh, which is understandable, is, you know, how does the Heroes of Mavia team avoid the big issues like, you know, a pump and dump scheme happening uh, with the rubies? Um, so what are the mechanisms you guys have in place to ensure uh, that, you know, the economy remains sustainable with the influx of players or, or certain types of, uh, of players who are trying to game the system to, to one up everyone else and, and you know, have that, that scheme in place? I can answer that for him while he's fixing his mic. So, uh, yeah, this is, you know, this is the first thing we thought of when we were developing this. We don't want to build something that's a temporary phenomenon that's not sustainable. Uh, we're really trying to set a trend and a, a lot of a lot of people have told us you know we're all eyes on mavi as far as the tokenomics and constructing ruby because the approach we're doing is completely different than what most games do when you when you ask any game if you ask any traditional game what's your goal of launching this game obviously it's to you know make a great game it's to make something people enjoy but they're from the business decision it's to get the most amount of players and get the most amount of in-app purchases but Ours is not, and people get confused when we say that, but ours is not to get the most amount of players. Ours is to actually retain the most quality players, maintain competitiveness, and maintain sustainability. It's a completely different approach. That's why our land is so limited, because A, it adds an element of predictability. The number one thing for us is predictability. We need to know and plan what's going to happen. So if you let millions of players in there's nothing predictable about that at all you know how many different personalities are involved how many different interests are involved how many different types of backgrounds are involved there's no way for a team to predict and especially if a space is so new this space nobody nobody can claim in web3 gaming they have the answers because to this date no one's been in the space long enough to say they have a track record that's proven sustainable no one's done it it's too new it's impossible so what we have to do is take a very conservative approach we do that by starting small. Now, it doesn't mean start small with the vision. Start small with the amount of people we let in. Keep it controlled, keep it tight, and analyze every metric you can about those players. That's why you build a, a very strong funnel. It's, it's almost like our launch. It's a launch, and it's, but it's small compared to the scale of most games, like in Web 2. You know, it's very small compared to the millions of players they can anticipate because we need to analyze. We can't predict. How are we supposed to predict? You, you can do surveys and talk to people, but you can't test anything until it's live. So our live is still limited in size, as we've told our community time and time again. When it's that small, and we consider anything, we even consider 50,000 small, you know, when it's that, because we really, Mavia is looking to bridge traditional gaming into Web3 gaming. A lot of Web2 gamers have a problem with Web3 gaming because of the issues we're discussing right now. They haven't found a project that solved these issues. Therefore, the first word that comes to their mind is scam. So no one will fix that until, common sense, someone fixes the problem, right? Someone makes a sustainable game and shows it can be done. Uh, because it's never been done, we have to experiment. We can't experiment unless it's a controlled subject group. So we're keeping it tight. We're going to analyze what people's intentions are. We're going to get intense feedback from them. What do you like? It's almost like we're building two things. Most games, they just have to make it fun and, and it work. That's it. If people enjoy it, they win. We have to we have to build a game that people enjoy, but then it's even a bigger task to make in a, a mini nation, a mini economy that people want to contribute to, partake in, and it sustains long-term. We have like two things we're juggling. So we have to keep it tight and controlled so we can analyze. So to answer your question, here's the variables we're introducing that do that. One, controlled subject group. There's a limited amount of land. 
Two, limits to the amount of ruby. If they can, if they can earn unlimited ruby, which actually they can, which I'll explain in a moment, but if they can just sit there all day, you know, and just play and their only intentions to mint and farm ruby, it almost breaks the system. What you have to do is set limits to how much can be minted, but we don't want the players to say, okay, you know, I washed my hands for today. Uh, I minted all my ruby. We want to allow them to still keep playing and it'd be fun, right? It's a game still. It's not going to work. So what they do is after a certain point, the system switches. You minted all your ruby. You created your quote unquote drain on the economy for the day, which is fine. We have systems in place for that. So it's completely encouraged. Now it switches. Now you're not minting any more ruby. You're not creating more ruby out of thin air. Now you're stealing ruby from others, which actually helps because now it creates competitiveness. You know, it's almost like Mavi is the perfect game for play to earn because there's two components to it. There's offense and there's defense. Offense is when you're attacking others, obviously, and you're stealing their ruby. But if you have no defense, someone's just going to steal yours. Now, there's limits. You can't just completely get wrecked and get everything taken and all your hard work. It's reasonable. Just like Clash of Clans, you know, you can get your gold taken, your oil taken, the same concept here. But if you don't have strong defense, you will get your hard-earned money taken with ruby. And you don't have good offense, you'll never earn anything. So you got to be well-rounded. And that's why the strongest players are going to realize they have to, now how do you, how do you improve your army? A, there's skill. Uh, there's, you can strategically place your walls. You can strategically place your turrets. You can strategically place your troops. And when you're attacking, you can be very strategic in the way you do it. But at some point you need stronger troops to be able to compete. If someone just has a crazy army, they're going to stop, stop over you. What, what solution did we make to allow someone to build a stronger defense and a stronger offense? Well, you can reinvest in your heroes. Your heroes defend your base. Your heroes help with offense. And what is a hero? It's an NFT. It's a sink. So now players, they recognize the value of reinvesting the Ruby earnings into their NFTs. They recognize the monetary value of reinvesting into their base. It makes them have build something to progress in. But they also understand the value of investing in heroes, not because it looks cool, not because it's just fun, but it's actually... Uh, it's actually helping them excel in the game. But it has to be fair where it's not just pay to win because we don't want to create a system where the, the rich players essentially can beat everyone else. That's why there's something called HQ levels. There's stats, there's stars. This is an issue that's already been solved, the pay to win issue uh, uh, with many, many games in, in mobile. But let's use Clash of Clans as an example. If you have millions of dollars and just buy everything, it doesn't mean you're going to win. Not at all. There's too much strategy involved. You, if you're a bad player and you have the best troops, you can still lose. The tournament winners in Clash of Clans aren't the richest. They're the best players. They're the most competitive. So we've struck a balance between using your Ruby earnings to progress in the game, but also needing to keep that equipped with skill to match that as you progress. Otherwise, you're, it's almost like you have too big of a shoe to fit inside of it. Perfect. And uh, now we have you, Tristan, a quick question. Well, not a quick question. Maybe it's a, a lengthier question. But where do you think the future of Web3 is? Where do you think this is all going? So it's a very interesting question. Uh, I think, you know, there's there's many aspects to Web3 besides just gaming. But as it applies to gaming, I don't think, like, uh, you know, a lot of people are moon boys. They said Web3 is going to change everything which it may, but I think there's a lot of applications Web3 doesn't need to be applied towards. Like if you're an indie developer, not just for games, but for applications in general, you don't need a token. You know, you don't need to be on blockchain. There's, there's many things that are doing perfectly fine without it. But what is Web3 going to definitely disrupt? I think gaming is one of the main things because not, not every game, the players aren't demanding all their games are giving them NFTs. We understand this fully. Players aren't demanding their favorite games from you know the early 2000s switch to an nft model so that they can own their assets but when you allow people from a technical level to seamlessly own the assets they're working towards it's going to open up new doors new types of games that can be developed that couldn't be for because of the user experience because the technology wasn't there we could not build web3 games so it's not saying everything from web2 is going to become web3 which some people say you know i don't agree with that but it's, it's a new opportunity. Like VR, right? No one was demanding they work inside of VR 10 years ago. 
that wasn't a problem that existed. But what did it do, this technology? It created new opportunities. People, just like people in the early 1900s weren't demanding telegrams so they could message someone, but they didn't even know what existed. These are things that develop over time. Web3 is going to open new opportunities that weren't there before, and people are very creative. We're going to find ways, some stuff we're not even discussing right now is going to come up probably in like a year with gaming, and it's going to disrupt everything. And we hope to keep staying ahead of the curve and maybe implementing some of those things. But it just opens up a new platform and a new door that no one had access to before, that players can really control it. What Everything we're structuring is trying to go with that ethos too. Like the players own it, the players control it. This is a player-owned game, not a corporate-owned game. The profits, they don't, don't go to a single entity, they go to the token holders as a whole. Because uh, of the of the Ruby inflation and mechanisms so i love that that concept of web3 disrupting the games market in the same way the telegram the invention that telegram did uh all the way back then i think that's a that's a beautiful way of kind of putting where where the market's at and what's happening in right now one of the yeah, things no, I'm... exactly that. Yeah. oh sorry tristan go ahead no go ahead i was just going to confirm what you said i agree 100 percent so one of the things that ties right into a question from the audience is when you were talking about, you know, the limited uh, land and how you're using that as a mechanism to control the economy. Um, one of the audience questions actually uh, is, is, is interesting and, and it caught my attention because, you know, when it comes to managing the economy, you sort of sometimes you might have uh, gameplay, uh, you know, consequences uh, so, you know, you're controlling the amount of land so that you can manage the economy, but how are you going to manage matchmaking, uh, you know, if you have, you know, limited land and you don't have like the, the or, or you're controlling, you know, the, the influx of players, how would you, how would you, you know, handle matchmaking during those early stages of the, the, the game's life cycle? You know, if someone plays a lot and someone plays less uh, and, you know, maybe there aren't enough players online at certain hours to, to compete. So how would you manage that um, aspect of the gameplay? That's a very good question. This is another thing we're very fortunate to have our model on. So because if, if our game worked where two players need to be online to play, we'd be in a bit of trouble. Okay. Because now we only, we are limited to matchmaking with just players that are online, which is maybe what 10, 20% at any given time. We don't have, that's not the case. Uh, we are able to matchmake with players who are offline due to the nature of our game, which is the base defense automatically. When you're attacking a base, that player does not need to be online. So step one to your question, the answer is, we've opened up the pool to every single player, even when they're not online, even when they're asleep, they can be defending their base because their base works for them automatically. So that solves a large chunk of the issue, but still we're gonna need a lot of players uh, and bases. So we have several things uh, that we have planned. Some has to do with having uh, some team developed bases that kind of keep a, a wide pool of competition on each HQ level. A actually the larger, problem to your question is isn't even the amount of comp competitors inside the pools it's how do you keep a strong pool in each hq level maybe a lot are in hq1 lesser in hq2 even lesser in three all the way to 10 what happens if someone goes to 10 there's no competition there right because it takes a while to get there someone may have purchased ruby that's the real problem and we ha we have solutions for that uh we don't want to give them all away because just like matthew was saying i'm a little bit more on the i like to be strategic with what we reveal so um, we do have some things in place to keep that competitive and keep a large pool there. Uh, but the main problem for us, for our game type, isn't really how many online players there are or how many players there are, period, because there is a wide pool, because we can tap into offline players. The real issue is how do you keep enough competitive uh, pool options for the players at the higher levels when most players aren't there yet? So if I may add on the uh, matchmaking, uh, it's also a mix of uh, calculating the value of the base, you know, where every uh, piece of building has a score in a database. And then uh, we don't really care, you know, because if someone is level eight, but he's almost done and someone is level nine, but he just got started, you know, they should be able to fight each other, right? Because the difference is not huge. So it's about the score of the base, and then uh, it's going to do plus 100, minus 100, you know, and increase the range 
like this until it finds someone. Plus the second component is the helo. So it's based on like the capacity of the player, you know, is he, is he a good player? He, he, does he win often? Does he lose often? So you can put people who win often uh, towards each other and the people who lose often uh, towards the other, even if they have the same HQ level, because the HQ level is just one matrix, right? Then you also need the, the uh, I don't know how to say it's like the, the skill of the player, right? Because uh, it can be same level, but one win often and one lose often. So ideally, if you want to have fun, you need to match making uh, people who also based on the skill as well, of course. Right. Uh, so Ivan, we have a very interesting question here, which is how long did it take you to, to build out that model? Uh, actually, so uh, again, uh, Mathieu will laugh every time, but we have this uh, now joke <laughs> is that I did this on Firefox. Okay, I did not know. So, and the point is that it's funny, but it's not so funny because actually there is many things that doesn't work. So I did basically work with one end in the back. Okay, and I think I may, uh, I, I think it was uh, the first model, the one that was posted on Twitter. I think it was maybe one night, maybe two nights. Uh, I try, it was never means to be posted. I just say, hey, Tristan, look at what I'm doing. And he said, oh, that's so cool. And then it was on, the, on Twitter, you know. So uh, and I was like, no, please stop. It's not finished. I don't want people to see it in this uh, stage, you know. And uh, and then boom, it was on Twitter. So <laughs> this is um, this was like very rough. And uh, after that, I spent a couple more nights on it to extend to extend to the version two. But again, I, I, pre I, pre I think it needs like five more versions or something, you know just to make it clean, to make it very performant, because performance is also something, you know, when you work with nodes, you know, you have to, uh, you know, there is a notion of ticks, you know, ticks matter. So you have to make sure that it goes in the right amount of ticks to the pool. Or, so there is optimization that needs to be done in different layers of reading, as you said, personas, you know, all of these things needs to be evaluated on the second graph. So there is a, so yeah, just a couple of days, it was fast. I think uh, once you, and I think the most of it was done in one night. So overall, I think it's three nights uh, total in something, in, in not into the master plan, into figuring out what, how it works, right? But just making the nose connect and uh, going to the point it is. It's something like that, maybe a week, maximum. Got it, got it. And uh, from there, it was a uh, very insightful. So it helped, uh, it was great. We it flew back and forth, you know, while it was there, so. And um, and also one thing, I saw a question pass uh, that we did not answer and I cannot answer it very well because uh, it's part of the stuff that uh, <laughs> we haven't talked so much, but I think that the potential into, uh, because one of uh, our objective is definitely to try to to to, to bridge this gap on to, on, between crypto game and, and uh, regular games. And I believe, honestly, it's possible. I think the, I give you a couple examples that uh, can work, but the goal, the, the objective of the players can be totally different. You don't have to be everyone working towards the same goal. They can have goals that are totally different. There is um, there, already like in the Kickstarter world, you know, you have the will that many people want to invest into games. So crypto, not crypto, there is already this logic, you know, that happens since many years of like people. Um, so for some people, 20 bucks means a lot. For some people, 20 bucks means nothing. And so there is people who go on Kickstarter and they support projects they love. This is something that happened already since a long time, right? But then once the game is started, these people basically feel like, oh, okay, this is something from the past. Now the game is released. That's not anymore Kickstarter. That's not anymore me who participate into it. And I think this is one way also to bridge the gap is that, um, you know, this idea that Kickstarter make you feel part of a project, but after that, it kind of like go his own way, you know, it flies, you know, uh, with the company and the Kickstarter uh, bakers stay on the line. Look at uh, Star Citizen or stuff like this, you know, project get started and like go into uh, um, their own direction and leaves the initial bakers on the line. While if uh, the initial bakers basically have a part into it, you know, this is uh, one way to, to also connect these uh, two worlds together. So, and that's just one idea. So roles in the game can be different or um, the aspect that there is already different behavior. Also people can exchange services. Um, uh, one player like to do this type of activity. One player doesn't like to do this activity. So creating an ecosystem where someone uh, gives to the other what he doesn't have, like to do, you know, 
uh, I give you an idea. Yeah, like you could have uh, NPCs in the game be uh, players, you know, who are like doing a play to earn, while regular players doesn't have to be an NPC, you know, or uh, you, 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 there is many uh, things like that that can be done. So, and I think this is the way that you maybe bridge the gap between both, you know. So um, there's two different ways that maybe uh, give some options to some people. Got it. Um, there's a question uh, for the machinations team that I'll, I'll answer super quickly, which is, uh, you know, in response to the large projects that can arise, you know, are there any thoughts to organizing and grouping these projects when they get to the site? So that's something that me and Matthew were talking about uh, uh, last week, I think. Um, and it, it's something that we're, we're trying to find um, some interesting solutions for. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll keep the community updated on that. Um, Yvonne, there's, a, there's an interesting question here, which is about bots. So how do you prevent bots? How do you plan on countering them? Um, and you know, will the rubies be confiscated or unusable and how will that work? I can, I can answer that. Uh, so the bots aren't as big of an issue in our game because there's, it's not so simple. It's, it's very complex. Uh, even on the web, let's say you developed some kind of AI that could competitively play. There's too many unknown variables to run simulations. That would have to be pretty advanced. So I don't, I don't think we're there yet. So I don't see bots being an issue. Uh, even the players that stay online 24 seven can still get attacked. Unlike some of the, some of the games, uh, like other base builder games that you can't get attacked when you're online, we don't have that. So there's really no benefit to using a bot because you'll lose battles. If you lose battles, you're opening yourself up to attacks. If you lose attacks, you're getting, you know, you're losing Ruby. So the way you prevent bots is not make them worth anything in your game. Like it's not worth it to use a bot because it'll actually harm you. Uh, it won't be through strict condemnation and, you know, confiscating your account. We, we think the proper solution to bots is not even make it necessary to use one. Like disincentivize the use of bots. If there's no need to use it, then no one's going to do it. Uh, and instead of just saying, if we catch you doing it, you know, you're going to pay, I'd, I'd rather make it so that there's no need. Like if you, if you use the bot, what is it going to do? It can't fight for you. It's too complex. Uh, there's too many unknown variables inside the base that you're attacking, such as the hidden troops they have that you can't see that would completely change the dynamic of the game. It'd have to think very quick. It, it can't run that many simulations. So we solve that issue by not having a bot prone game. Plus, uh, past the, uh, as we said, there is a limit to uh, how many um, uh, ruby are minted. And, uh, and uh, after that, past this limit, you can continue to win ruby, but only by doing a three star and by stealing. So if you, I don't think the boats can consistently do three stars, you know, that would be very surprising because. Uh, Another great question. I think this is where Rob Peterson, which is, have you, um, how do you think about uh, social aspects of Web3 and how are you kind of planning to make it, you know, obviously you've got an incredible community, but how do you think the social aspects will kind of interact within your game and how important is it in Web3? I think one of the coolest things that's going to happen that we're leading the charge on is esports. Uh, esports and Web3, I think it's an absolute game changer because the prize pool, you can directly tie it from the success of the game, which means the prize pool can be bigger. It's not just a marketing event for the company. Now it's like part of the ecosystem. We want to make esports part of the model. And it actually helps the Ruby model because you have two ways of looking at players. You know, we're talking about personas, right? What are the players' intentions? One is just to kind of form mind, try to ex extract as much value as possible. But the other is to win. And, and um, Mohamed was, was speaking about this, like the people who want to be competitive, who want to be elite. But if it's a player in game, they should want to be elite because they'll be also earning more also through that. You know, if they win the battle, the extreme battle, it's not just for the clout. It's not just for the flex. It's also because they'll win more. But you can't afford to do that for everyone. So we're structuring, and I'm not going to give away all the, the secrets, like I said, but we're structuring a model where we think more players will want to play 
competitively because there's bigger rewards and the rewards are basically automated. It's not something we internally say, okay, you know, this week we're going to do this. It's part of the system. It's part of the infrastructure of the game is that there's, there's winners and there's not winners. And you can disproportionately reward the players who win, but it actually balances the game a lot easier because the people who didn't are going to want to try for next time. And it's not like one, two winners. I'm talking a lot of winners, like a lot of winners. People, you're, the people you're competing against and, and the people you know in Discord who you're there day one, these guys are killing it. So people, you got to, you got to, they got to chase that big picture, that big dream, as opposed to just thinking, how can I cash out as much as I, as I can today, you know? So for social aspects, I guess the answer is for us, uh, you know, if, and with respect to Mavia, I think esports is going to be the real game changer for us. And we've already partnered with Team Queso, which is the largest Latin American esports team, uh, especially for Clash of Clans. If you look at Clash of Clans, they follow them on Twitter. I mean, these guys are no joke. And we have, I'm not going to say who, but we have several others, so they're big, maybe even bigger. Uh, already in the pipeline that are that are closed basically so we're going to be releasing them soon but esports is something that we're placing a big big bet on frankly because we think our game is very esports friendly you know a lot of games are not that fun to play right now but we think ours is very streamer friendly full of drama full of action full of different diversity of the characters and the skins it's very esports friendly so we're placing a big bet on that for social and the match will be playable also beauty of the blockchain yeah, every single match, we all almost like have our own streaming platform built. And people will still use Twitch and YouTube, of course. We we will incentivize that. We we will encourage that. But we want uh, every single battle that's fought in Mavi to be permanently recorded, almost like a blockchain of battles. So you have Ether Scan where you go look at the transactions. We want the same thing for battles. Oh, he he fought six months ago. This guy, here's how much he won. Here's what he did with it. It's like a trail of every transaction in the game. Very open and cool. And where we're going well over time, and I think this has been uh, a fantastic session and you know, a huge shout out to the Heroes of Mavia team for coming on and kind of uh, walking us through what they're doing to, to prepare uh, and to make sure they've got a, a fantastic game economy. Um, just for everyone, obviously, we get this session's being recorded and we'll pop it up on the YouTube channel if anybody wants to go through and uh, review it. Um, are there any kind of, do you want to wrap us up, Mo? Yeah. So uh, again, wanted to thank the Heroes of Mavia team for joining us today. And, you know, I think it was a very insightful discussion. Uh, you know, I think the audience, uh, you know, enjoyed it and learned a lot. Uh, wanted to, uh, you know, let everyone know that, uh, you know, the Heroes of Mavia team do have an active Discord. Um, and someone was asking about the white paper as well. Uh, there is no white paper for the project, uh, I believe, but there is the deck on the website, correct? Right, yep. Perfect. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to machinations, we have our YouTube, we also have our Discord. Uh, they're being linked in the chat, so join us there. And uh, yeah, thanks again to everyone for joining us today. Um, this recording will go live in a couple of weeks. Um, and, uh, yeah, if there's anything else you guys, uh, wanna, wanna say before we close off. Oh, amazing. Thank you so much. It was great. Uh, I had a good time. Yep. Likewise. Great team. Thank you guys. Thanks guys. And, uh, we'll be in touch on discord. We'll continue our conversation there. Mm -hmm.